Shalom and welcome to another time of Israel's Hope Bible Church Online. My name is Ron Grossman and we are starting new studies in the book of Philippians for Sunday morning. So we're going to be doing an introduction today of the book and along with that at the same time we're going to be doing a little bit of study in the early part of the, um, the letter. So before we start, let's um, pray and ask the Lord to bless this time we're going to have together over the next uh, number of weeks and also for the direction of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we do thank you for every, everyone looking in. Thank you for eternal life in Jesus and for what you do for us. Now we ask that you would uh, guide and direct in everything said and done, giving you all the glory and honor, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So read with me, please, the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 1. It says this, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you are making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have in you my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment that you may approve such things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. These 11 verses, this first chapter, is a fantastic doxology, you might say, of uh, encouragement that Paul is giving to this church in Philippi. Well, a little bit of background about the church in Philippi and the um, Philippian people. This is the first church that was planted in Europe. It was founded by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, uh, journey. Now, Philippi was a small city in Macedonia that was founded by Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great. The most personal letter of any that you find in the New Testament epistles, as they're referred to, the letters, is written by Paul here. Some call it, some com commentators call it, Paul's great letter of love. It's the most personal, as I've said. They had helped him financially many times. Turn to chapter 4, verse 16 of this same letter. Chapter 4, verse 16, and we read this. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. This is uh, one verse in the New Testament scripture that speaks to those who take the gospel as missionaries as being supported by those away from the work that they are in. So in other words, perhaps the church here at Philippi, as it says here, he, he thanked them for what he sent. Uh, we know that they were sent from Antioch, when you read in Acts chapter 13, and they went out into the Roman Greco world. We know that they went trusting God. There, beneath the problem, uh, beneath the surface, though, there were a number of problems in this uh, body of believers, and they were going to be addressed. There were rivalries and personal ambition. We'll read about that in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and chapter 4, verse 2. And also, there was the teaching of the Judaizers, something that Paul devoted a whole book to, the book of Galatians, but he deals with this succinctly in this uh, letter, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And then he also deals with another false doctrine or two that came into the church, there was the false doctrine of perfectionism, and he deals with that in chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. And he also uh, deals with what is referred to as the antinomian libertines, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Now, this is probably one of the more important uh, false teachings that he de deals with here. The antinomianism, it's a difficult word to pronounce, you'll forgive me, is a belief that the Christian life is to be subject to, to any rules whatsoever. It's not to be subject to any rules whatsoever. 
So this is something that Paul, who was the one who God used to develop much of the New Testament theology, and we'll see some of this uh, theology here in this opening chapter. And you'll see that the whole notion in false teaching of antinomianism is in fact that, false teaching. There's something here that needs to be said as we fast forward from the first century AD to the 21st century today, in the 20th and the 2000s AD, that false teaching has sadly always been within the church. And because of that false teaching within the church, there is need to be on guard all the time. So it's an encouragement to us. As Paul encouraged the Philippian believers, we also will be encouraged here to um, make certain that believers have a good foundation in what it is that they believe. Now let's start with uh, our study here in the first 11 verses. Now the church was founded by Paul and Timothy. They're mentioned to us in chapter 1. This is very common of uh, first century, this part of time. Uh, it was a common uh, linguistic style, the writing style of the time. The, the writer would name himself. So it's not that Timothy was a writer. Uh, most and many believe that Paul uh, employed a scribe and he would dictate to the scribe what needed to be written. But Timothy was with Paul and worked with Paul and in particular was working with Paul in the establishment of this body of believers. They are the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi and with the bishops and the deacons. Well, there's uh, that big word, bishops. Some people would start thinking that, well, it sounds like Catholicism. Well, it's not. The word here from our English Bible, bishops, means literally overseers. People who have been put into positions of responsibility to oversee the body of believers, and in particular, the body of believers here. So, these are the deacons as well. These are the ones that serve tables, take care of the physical needs of the people. And then you have the bishops who take care of the spiritual needs of the people. And this is where you find within the um, New Testament church, and I believe it to be biblical, that leadership and government of the church is taken care of through those who are there to take care of the spiritual needs of the people and then those to take care of the physical needs of the people. Now if you go to Acts chapter 6 and we're studying Acts in our midweek meeting and you can find all of those messages archived still on our YouTube page. You can access our YouTube page through our web page at www.ihopecanada.org and you'll find there in our studies the book of Acts and Acts chapter 6 how they, appo uh, they appointed various men to take care of the physical needs of the people when there was a dispute that erupted in the early church in Jerusalem. So there's a couple of things we can take from that too is that God knowing in his foreknowledge knowing that there would be, need to be oversight gives us a direction through God, his appointed leadership Paul and Timothy here in this case were appointed of God. These are the missionaries who were sent, planted, established the church, and continued to guide it, and left behind those in positions of authority. Now look what he says to the church in Philippi. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very Judaistic way of referring to God. The early uh, first century Jewish community referred to God as the father of creation. So this is not something that's new to the church. God was seen as the father of creation. And you can see a picture of that as you look through the Gospel of John. In fact, the first 14 verses where we get an oversee, uh, oversight of, of how God established all of creation. And in all of that, he called out the, the various persons that came to be those who are 
in the lineage of Jesus. You can also find that more, uh, you might say, uh, it is more uh, distinct, there is more study appointed to it in the Gospel of Matthew, where you go through a whole genealogy. John approaches it in a slightly different way. The important thing, though, is that it is a presentation from a Jewish perspective. Paul and Timothy were Jewish men. And the early church was made up of Jewish people, primarily. But here in Philippi, this is a gen primarily Gentile congregation of people. But Paul still will speak to him, to them, out of his own uh, context, of his own uh, background and, and where he has come from. It's no different for myself. I'm a Jewish believer, but I'm a follower of Jesus. And I will express sometimes some things from my own Jewish uh, background. But I also realize that as a follower of Messiah, that I am no longer required to be under the law. The law being fulfilled, now I am under the authority of Jesus the Messiah. And not only am I under his authority, but I serve him in this a position like this. In a way... We can say that what I do here, and as I've been appointed to it, I'm a bishop within the church. I'm taking care of the spiritual needs of the people. So I hope that, that helps you to understand those things. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. What a fantastic verse. And it's something that should drive us in our day-to-day -day living. That we are thankful to God for those whom God has brought into our lives. And I look back at my life over the last 43 years of being a follower of the Messiah, a Jewish believer in Jesus. Just 12 days after my Jewish wife and I were married, I turned to Jesus for salvation. A year less, just a little bit less than a year later, my Jewish wife turned to the Lord as well for salvation. And God has been gracious to us. There's the grace of verse 2. Grace is unmerited favor. I didn't deserve salvation. I didn't deserve to see my wife come to salvation a whole year later, almost a whole year later. And through the years of our marriage and three sons, I didn't deserve for them to become believers in Jesus. God has been gracious to me. And I praise him for what he has given me. It didn't mean I just sat back and let it happen. I had responsibility. The responsibility that we all have we're all bishops, if I can say it like that, in our own homes. We have a responsibility first at home to bring up our family, our wives, our children, to encourage them to see to their uh, growth in the Lord. We will give an account for that. If you can't have your own personal house in order, how can you go and try and bring order into God's house? So there's a very important attachment to the two things and so I may be a follower of Jesus but the only way I can do what I'm doing is by being submissive to God being under his authority and being as gracious to those around me as others have been to me as well God has been so gracious to me if I can say it like that that even though at 10 years of age I lost my own father physical on earth father the Lord, knowing to take care of me, brought other men into my life that eventually was all part of what God used to bring me to know the Messiah personally. That's another story for another time. And we have a testimony brochure that can speak to that if you're interested. Um, we'll deal with that at the end of the message today. Now look what it says here in verse 4. And here's something that teaches us about how we should live as believers in Jesus. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. Here is Paul's great joy. He says he has great joy in verse 3 and now he takes this further by saying my great joy is translated into prayer and I pray for you. No one was excluded from the prayers of the Apostle Paul. Do you pray like that for someone? Someone you know, someone you know well, close personal friends, family members? Do you pray like that? 
Now look at verse 5, because this is continuing the same uh, theme that begins in verse 4. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. For your relationship to me in the gospel. God used the Apostle Paul and Timothy to reach the city of Philippi for the gospel. And some responded, and they are uh, those whom he gives great, um, great remembrance of. He counts it a joy to know them. He prays for them um, extensively, making requests with them for them with joy, and then their fellowship in the gospel from the first day of their coming to the Lord, of His coming to that place. He prays and gives thanks for the fellowship in the gospel of their relationship together, which is all because of the gospel. Had I not turned to Jesus, it didn't matter when it happened. Had I not turned to Jesus. My life would have been absent of so many great opportunities that God gave me to reach others for the Lord and to know others who had impact and input into my own life. And because of that, it gives you a sense of great peace and can give you nothing more than great joy. So knowing all of that, he goes on in verse 6, and he says this, being confident of this very thing. The very thing is going to come in the latter part of the sentence here. However, his confidence is built upon what he has started talking about here. He thanks God for their remembrance. He prays for them all the time. He thanks God that he has fellowship with from them from the first day with them for the first day onward and now he has confidence of this very thing and what is that this is what we call the doctrine of eternal security look what it says here that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ now that word perform in the King James English here can better be understood literally as the word complete. So let's read that with substituting perform. Not that it's, a, it's a, a wrong word or anything, but it'll give us a different rendering, a different understanding in our 21st century ideas. He which had begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has started a work in you. If you think that you became a follower of Jesus and you no longer need to have anything happen in your life, well then you are in error. We all are being shaped, molded, changed, and brought to a better relationship with God. I once heard someone say that if I were any better, I asked someone in, in church one Sunday morning, how are you, Mrs.? And she looked at me, and in her very deep, gravelly voice, she was an elderly person, said, quote, if I was any better, I'd be dead. And I kind of looked at that and I, for a second, and then she, she laughed. Then I understood. When your time here on earth is ready to end, it's because God has brought you to where he can bring you as far as he possibly could, would. He has you here for a period of time to do two things. One, to grow in the Lord. Two, to be used as a witness, as Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20 says, going out, present perfect tense, never stopping, keep on going out and bring the gospel to all the nations. This is the responsibility of the church. And as you grow as a believer, progressively over time, you will become a person who can grow and learn and be able to serve better for the Lord Jesus. It's an ongoing process. It's in the perfect present tense. He will perform it. He will complete it. And then he goes on in verse 7 and says this, Even as it is meet for me, that word meet is an old English word, we can substitute the word, even as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both of you in my bonds, that's chains, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers sharing 
in my grace or of my grace. Now, this is one of the letters that was written from jail. And Paul was under house arrest and spent about a year under house arrest. And when he was under house arrest, he wrote letters to the various churches that he had gotten to know where he had shared the gospel. In verse 6, he praises God for the beginning and working through of good works in the lives of these believers. In verse 7 now, he thank, in the Greek, he gives a sense of the fact that they are intertwined together. Uh, the language gives that sense that they are so intertwined that there's no breaking them apart. And they have love and concern for one another goes on in verse 8 and he says this, for God is my record. That word there, record, can be better translated. God is my witness. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a very old English rendering. And that word needs to be understood. It speaks to the fact your bowel is in the deepest part of your physical body. And so what is being um, uh, Rend, uh, you might say, given to us here to understand is that from deep down inside, Paul has a, an important affection and concern for this people. Affection for them because he has seen them come to know the Lord Jesus. His desire is to see them grow. And so he goes on, as he's deeply concerned for them, in verse 8, he goes on in verse 9 and he says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Perhaps this was his example. And he implored this to the Philippians to show the same deep love and concern for others to grow as well. He wanted to display to them a deep knowledge of discernment, to be, to be enabled to love in Christ. Here I am. I'm Paul. I have a deep, innermost affection and concern for you. And I want you to have the same. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across to them. How often are we duped, though, by people who say they are so deeply concerned for us but really, what they're trying to do is take advantage of us. We must remain vigilant. And we must remain knowing that God has put overseers in our lives to help us to see when some things are not the way they should be. It goes on in verse 10. And he says this, That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The day of Christ is twofold. The day of Christ will be the rapture of the church when God comes to supernaturally remove his people from planet earth. And the day of Christ will also be when God comes back with the church in the person of Jesus and subdues this planet at the end events of the book of Revelation so that he may put down all the evil of that time, throw Satan into um, the the pit for a thousand years and the Antichrist and the false beast or the false prophet of the beast will be thrown into the eternal lake of fire forever. That will be for a thousand years and at the end of one thousand years Jesus, uh, the Satan will be loosed one last time. Now that's a whole study for another time. All I'm going to say to you about that is this, is that even though God is doing that and it looks to be in a way uh, it goes against you know common sense, God knows what he's doing. He's going to set up a 1,000 year reign of Christ here on planet Earth. And there are going to be people who will go into that 1,000 year reign in corporeal bodies like we have now. If you're alive at the coming of Jesus, you'll be called out of here supernaturally after those who are the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. That begins the day of the Lord, as Paul the, uh, the Apostle calls it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 13. 1 to 11. The day of the Lord, and I've taught this for years like this, is simply this. It's not one single day. It's the time of God. And I have to 
a lot of study on it. I, I've come to the conclusion the day of the Lord is an indetermined period of time that begins from the rapture of the church through to the events of the book of Revelation into the coming of the Lord Jesus with us, the re resurrected, raptured church, to the establishment of the thousand-year reign of Christ on planet Earth, to that 1,000 years through, and while that 1,000 years goes on, there'll be us and our, our glorified bodies ruling with Christ here on Earth. He will cleanse the Earth, and there will be people with corporeal bodies like you and I who will uh, repopulate the Earth. And their children are going to have to make the same decision about Jesus that you and I have made. So you see, at the end of time, there will be some, even with Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, who will say, don't want to have anything to do with that Jesus. I don't believe in who he is. And there will be a rebellion one last time, and that will be the last time that God will cleanse everything. Then there will be a new heaven and a new earth after that. But until then, we are to be here to know till the day of Christ comes that we have a responsibility to do things in a certain way. And look at verse 11 says, as we conclude this time, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. If one is righteous in God, spiritually mature is what this means, then one is able to show forth fruits of righteousness. Now, a tree in the springtime, the, the leaves start to grow, Blossoms come out after that, and from the blossoms that are pollen, pollinated will come fruit that will be harvested in the fall. So your life is likened unto a fruit tree. You're planted, you grow, you uh, begin to show maturity with the uh, blossoms that come off of you, the tree, and that you are producing fruit. And that fruit is in your service for the Lord, your perhaps being used of others to lead others to the Lord. There are so many things that God has for you to do and that he wants you to do. So all I can say to you is, do you have a love and concern built upon spiritual discernment and are you ready, therefore, to meet the Lord at the day of Christ? Are you growing in Christ? Are you becoming what he wants you to become? You see, the day of Christ can come at any moment, and it can even come two seconds after I sign off here. So what are you doing with your life, and where are you going with it? How are you being used of God to be a servant for him? And as you serve him, think about how the Apostle Paul and Timothy were used in this place in Philippi to lead a small group of people to know Jesus as Messiah, and then to send a letter back to them to encourage them to grow in the Lord. And that's why we exist as a ministry to tell others about Jesus and to equip the local church in doing that. You can find various ways and means of uh, how we do that by going to our webpage, www.ihopecanada.org. And there you'll find the YouTube icon. If you click on that, you'll find this message and others as well that are archived there on our YouTube channel. If you want to simply go to the YouTube app, you can do that and just search for I Hope Canada. But it's easier to get to it through our webpage. And we are a faith ministry. We trust the Lord that he moves God's people to move and provide for the means that we need to do the work that he has called us to do. And we are praying that through the end of this month of October that the Lord would finish to continue what was seen as a $3,000 need just to end the month of October well. We're about all, just a little under two-thirds there. But I would ask if you would pray that the Lord would send the rest before the 31st of October. If you feel led of the Lord to give to this ministry, you can do that by going to our webpage. You can give through PayPal, which is a secure online method of giving. Or you can make an e-transfer. Look for the e-transfer icon there, and that can be done in Canada. And it'll show you the email address by which you need to uh, write to and um, make a deposit that will go directly 
to the work of I Hope Canada. If you are wanting to use a regular, the regular old-fashioned mail and a check in the mail, you'll find our uh, P.O. Box number there as well, and you can send that check in the mail to us. On another point, um, if you're in the United States and would like to assist the work in Canada, you can send that through our USA agency. Just put a check in the mail to I Hope USA, 2330 Norton Lane, North Bloomfield, Ohio, 44450. Just make sure you put on the memo line of the check that it's Grossman's Support Canada. And we'll look forward to seeing you here another time when we get back to our studies in Philippians on Sunday and our continued study in the Book of Acts on midweek. You can find them all on our webpage again on our YouTube icon. Go there and you can uh, seek out all of the archive messages, including this one, which will be posted there within the hour. If you've been looking on live, on Facebook Live, some of you have been during this time, thank you for looking in. Let's close our time in prayer. Father God, thank you for everyone who's been here today and who will be coming to look at us future. We'd ask now for your blessing on the time we have and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I sign off, I would be remiss not to remind you that our annual I Hope Canada Bible Prophecy Conference will be taking place virtual, online, and you can register for that. You must reg pre-register in advance. We have to get everybody registered so that we can get you that Zoom link in order to participate with us. Date of the conference is October 31st from 1 to 3.30 p.m. And you can email me at ron at ihopecanada.org. And you will, uh, I'll then email to our facilitator for Zoom that day, and you'll get a copy of the email I forward to him. Your emailing to me is your signification that you're giving us permission to pass on your email address and to include you that day. So we'll hope to see you there on October 31st at our annual conference. Now, the speakers will be myself, Pastor Mike Ferreira of Marku Road Bible Church, and also uh, will be um, George Ferrier, who is an itinerant um, evangelist uh, with Brethren Assemblies here in uh, Ontario. Till next time, we say to you, Shalom.